Okay, actually, before we before we start, let, let me encourage people to leave your camera on if you feel comfortable doing so. So it's nice, nice for the um, speaker if, if they can see us and <laughs> nice for us if we can see each other. So, um, okay, so uh, welcome back to the Oxford Discrete Maths and Probability Seminar. Um, it's, it's a pleasure to kick off this term uh, with Rose McCarty, um, who's talking from Princeton. And it's going to talk on average degree and go. Thanks, Rose. Yeah, thank you for the introduction and for the invitation to give a talk here. I hope that at some point I can do it in person. Uh, but let's just go ahead and jump right into it. Uh, so I want to start with the classic theorem of Erdos, which, which says that for any positive integers d and k, that there exists a graph with average degree at least d and girth at least k. Uh, so what you should think of is that these graphs have a lot of edges, but locally they look like a tree as in the picture. Yeah, so the average degree is really just the average degree of a vertex. And then the girth here is the length of the shortest cycle. Uh, and so these are really dense graphs, but graphs that locally look like a tree. And I think it's kind of surprising whenever you first learn about this, that these graphs even exist in the first place. Uh, but not only do they exist, uh, oh, sorry, let me start with, with this. So throughout the talk, I'm going to be skipping the fact that for every uh, D and K and just uh, word things like this, that there exists a graph with average degree, at least D and growth, at least K, because that'll save me a lot of time. Right, so not only do these graphs exist, but also they're really ubiquitous. So there's a random construction for creating these graphs. So you can begin with a big clique. And then for every edge, flip a coin. And if it is heads, say, keep the edge. And if it's tails, then delete the edge. And so if you do this, you're going to end up not getting too many triangles in the graph, say, and in general, not many short cycles. And so if you then delete an edge from each of those short cycles, you're going to get a graph that by construction has high girth. Uh, that also with high probability is going to have large average degree. Uh, so <laughs> in the example, the average degree isn't actually very large, unfortunately, because I had to do it with a kind of small graph. But if you do this with a big enough graph, then it will work. So there's an amazing conjecture of Carson Tomlinson, which is almost reaching its 40th anniversary. And it says that these graphs are so ubiquitous that they actually are contained in every graph of sufficiently high average degree. So formally, the conjecture is that there exists a function f so that every graph of average degree, at least f of d and k, has a subgraph with average degree at least d and girth at least k. So the conjecture is really that no matter what graph you start with, as long as it has sufficiently large average degree, you can find this subgraph that is still really dense, that still has big average degree, but that now also has high girth. Uh, so in the picture, I just deleted edges, but you're also allowed and might need to delete uh, vertices as well. Uh, okay, so I was actually surprised how long it took me to learn about this conjecture. I really think that this is just so absolutely fundamental, and it's been open for so long that it's about, about time that uh, uh, this was proven. And so I really want to, want to focus on, on this conjecture here. Uh, and so first of all, what's known about it? Well, uh, the construction that I showed earlier actually works for regular graphs in general. So you don't have to just start with the clique, but you can start with any regular graph. Uh, but you also can't reduce to the case of regular graphs. So Piber, Rodel, and Semiretti showed that there are graphs with huge average degree, uh, but no regular subgraphs, uh, except for, you know, maybe cycles. Uh, and also, by the way, I'm going to be, again, skipping some notation whenever I state things on the slides because that makes it easier to think about. So instead of saying that there exists a function f so that all this stuff holds, I'm just going to forget about that. And so whenever you read the statements on the slides, it should be read as every graph of sufficiently large average degree as a function of d and k. Okay, so that's uh, how, to, how to look at this. And so we know it's true for regular graphs, but you can't reduce to the case of regular graphs. Uh, but you can reduce to the case of bipartite graphs. So it's another easy probabilistic argument that if you flip a coin for each vertex and throw it to either one side or the other, and then you look at the bipartite graph going between the two sides, 
that you'll keep at least half of the edges of the graph in expectation. And so you can reduce the case of bipartite graphs quite easily. And then Kuhn and Ospis showed a theorem that says that within bipartite graphs, you can also get rid of the four cycles. So the theorem is that every bipartite graph of sufficiently large average degree has a subgraph with average degree at least k and no four cycles. So the point is that Tomlinson's conjecture is known for k equal to six because you can get rid of all of the odd cycles by reducing to bipartite graphs. And then Kuhn and Ostis showed how to get rid of the four cycles. And this is really all that's known about Tomlinson's conjecture in general. There are a number of special cases that are known and Delmonica and Rodel went beyond regular graphs and showed that it's enough that the maximum average degree is most like exponential in the average degree, right? So some approximates, approximately regular graphs, this is also known for. Uh, but in general, this is really all that's known about Tomasin's conjecture. Uh, and so I want to propose an even stronger conjecture. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you might ask why, you know, if uh, we don't know that much about Tomasin's conjecture, why are you proposing a stronger conjecture? But first of all, uh, there's as much evidence for this conjecture as for Tomasin's conjecture, and also it restricts the things you can do. Uh, so I don't want to allow you to delete edges. I'm just going to allow you to delete vertices, uh, because I think that people have kind of been looking the, at the wrong route and trying to do more things with deleting edges than is really necessary. And I think that you should just be able to delete vertices. Now we have to be careful with this because if I want to find an induced subgraph uh, with large average degree and large girth, I might not always be able to do that, right? Because I could have a complete bipartite graph. And now no matter what uh, vertices I delete, I'm either going to get a really, really sparse graph for a graph with four cycles, uh, but the conjecture is that that's the only obstruction. So uh, the conjecture is that every graph of sufficiently large average degree has either a KTT subgraph or an induced subgraph, which has average degree at least D and girth at least K. Okay, so let's go through what it says in pictures. It says, if you give me a graph of sufficiently large average degree as a function of these three parameters, that then I can either find a uh, big biclique as a subgraph, one that's balanced that has the same number of vertices on both sides, or I can, beginning with its original graph, I can delete vertices in order to find a graph of average degree at least D and growth at least K. Okay, so I think this conjecture is really surprising, but also really, really, basic, it's a natural question to ask if this sort of thing could be true. Uh, and I think the only thing that's really surprising about it is that it, it might be true. Uh, so I wanna go through the evidence for this. So we know that Tomasin's conjecture holds for, oh, and let me say also that this conjecture would imply Tomasin's conjecture because KTT is dense and regular and we know how to find subgraphs of large average degree and large girth within those. So this really is strictly stronger than Tomasin's conjecture. Uh, so you can also prove this conjecture for regular graphs, but it's a bit more involved in that you're going to apply the kovari so saron theorem. So I think this is really pretty. Uh, so whenever you're finding subgraphs that aren't induced, you're including edges independently at random with some probability. And so now we're gonna do the natural thing and include vertices independently at random with some probability. And the key point here is that you can use the kavari so saron theorem to bound the number of short cycles. So let's do that by just counting the number of four cycles in a deregular graph. And first I'm gonna do it in general for a deregular graph, and then I'll talk about deregular graphs with the forbidden KTT. Uh, so first of all, uh, let's look at the number of edges. So there are about ND edges, and then for every edge, you can look at the neighbors of one end and the neighbors of the other end, and you can choose a vertex from each side, and that upper bounds the number of four cycles containing the edge XY. 
So we said that we're also choosing a neighbor of y and a neighbor of x. So that gets some extra d squared. So we get about n d cubed many uh, four cycles as an upper bound. And now let's look at what happens when you forbid a KTT subgraph. So now the kavari soseron theorem tells us that if we look between the neighbors of Y and the neighbors of X, there are actually lots and lots of non-edges. Instead of having D squared many edges, you get this D to the two minus epsilon. And so you get about N D to the three minus epsilon many four cycles, uh, where epsilon is something that depends only on T. Right? And so the point is that this little extra amount that, uh, uh, that you get in this count of the number of four cycles is exactly what lets this argument go through. And then you include vertices independently at random with probability like one over D to the one minus delta for some really tiny but positive uh, delta. And once you do that, you can kind of see right away that you should still have large average degree. But because you have this bound on the number of four cycles, the arguments go through to let you delete a vertex from each four cycle instead of an edge from each four cycle. Okay, so that, that's just the, the fundamental idea of what's going on here, even though it's not uh, a full proof. So we know that you can, uh, that the conjecture is true for regular graphs. And a really amazing thing is that it's also possible to reduce to the case of bipartite graphs. Uh, and this is a rather recent theorem of Quine, Lester, Sudikov, and Tran. So the theorem is that every graph of sufficiently large average degree has either a big clique or an induced bipartite subgraph with average degree at least D. So in the picture, you give me a graph of large average degree and I find either a big clique or I can delete vertices in order to obtain a bipartite graph that has large average degree. And so I think this is kind of crazy. And I didn't, I didn't know about this theorem until starting to look at Tomasin's conjecture either. Uh, and so I think that this theorem should be, be better known. Uh, and their proof is certainly more involved than the non-induced case where we just included through vertices on one side or the other independently at random, but it's not too bad. Their proof is still really pretty. The basic idea is to go to the densest induced subgraph that you can. And then that graph is about F of T D degenerates. And if you take a degenerate ordering and include vertices independently at random with some probability and delete the smallest vertex of each triangle, then you can show uh, you can use induction on T in order to reduce to the case of triangle free graphs. And then they have a separate proof for triangle free graphs. So it's a little bit more involved, but it's still, uh, it's still a really nice proof. Uh, and then uh, I showed last year that you can do this analog of the Kuhn and Austin theorem, but uh, for induced subgraphs. So again, you can get rid of four cycles as long as there's no KTT, right? So the theorem is that every bipartite graph of sufficiently large average degree has either KTT or an induced subgraph with average degree at least D and no four cycles. And this is based on another proof of the Kuhn and Austin results by Delmonica, Kubik, Martin, and Rodel. Uh, they proved exactly the same thing for subgraphs and Basically, you can kind of massage their proof to get this induced subgraph version. Okay, so this is sort of a really quick summary of what's known in this direction. We went through everything on Tomasin's conjecture and then did all of the analogs in the induced setting. And so there's not much known about graphs that are close to being regular. I think that you can get something to work. Uh, but in general, we know that that sort of technique is never going to solve the full conjecture. And so I would still view that as, as a special case. I think that you need a different route in order to attack the main conjecture. And the main reason why I you know, was interested in this area and proposing this conjecture is that now if you want to solve Tomasin's conjecture, 
maybe you should just try and take this bipartite graph with no four cycles and look for an induced subgraph, right? There's less you can do, and that should restrict uh, the potential approaches to proving the conjecture. Uh, now it's actually already a good time for questions. Is there anything about just what the statements are? I really like this area because uh, it's just, I think it's simple to state everything. You just need to know what the average degree in girth is. And then that's that's it. And so I think it's amazing that uh, there is so much that's still open about this area. Uh, but I actually was approaching some of these questions for a different reason. And those are analogs with chi boundedness. So chi boundedness asks, when is the chromatic number of a graph approximately the same as its clique number? And you can ask the same sorts of questions for average degree in these KTT subgraphs. And so let me go through a sort of analogous uh, statement to what we've been looking at so far, but in this, this different context. Bruce, before you move on, I think Agalos had a question. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, yes. Uh, how large is this F at the bottom theorem? That's a great question. And that's actually exactly what we're going to be getting into. Uh, I don't think I'm going to state it until the end. So let me maybe just give you a hint right now. It's like two to the two to the two to the. That's it. <laughs> uh, and now there's a polynomial in T. But then the dependence on D, I'm not actually even sure what it is. There's some function of D. I cared more about the dependence on T. Oh, just polynomial. Right, <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I mean, a priori, there's no reason there should be any bound on F at all. Uh, and that will be something that uh, I'm talking about in the next 10 minutes or so. But it's not a good bound and it shouldn't be optimal. Right, so the leading question that I want to talk about now is informally, when is the maximum average degree of a graph tied to the size of its largest balanced spike leak? So the maximum average degree of a graph just asks for the maximum overall non-empty subgraphs of the average degree of that subgraph. And the question is, when is it enough to consider subgraphs that are just these balanced spike leaks? So to make it a little bit more formal, let me call the biclic number of a graph to be the maximum integer t, so that g has a KTT subgraph. And I really mean subgraph. I don't care if there are extra, extra edges here. Uh, OK, I hope this stays up on the slide for a minute so we can remember the notation. But just remember, I've been using t throughout the talk to talk about KTT. And so t is, is tau. Uh, and so I'm calling this the, the biclic number. So a little bit more formally, the question is, for which classes of graphs does there exist the function f that the maximum average degree of that graph is at most some function of its biclic number? So the point here is that tau of g is an obvious uh, lower bound on the maximum average degree of a graph. This blue inequality always holds. And so the question is, when is that an approximate upper bound? Basically, when is there this really simple structural reason uh, for the maximum average degree being large? Uh, and so again, we know that there exists graphs of arbitrarily large average degree in girth. And so you can kind of cheat for this question by adding in a big biclique to one of these graphs. And so from now on, all classes that I'm going to talk about are closed under deleting vertices, uh, i.e. taking into subgraphs. So I'm going to allow you to to delete vertices to do that. And with this assumption, this question at the top, it really doesn't make a difference whether I look at maximum average degree or average degree. I can go ahead and go to an induced subgraph with maximum average degree, with largest average degree. Uh, so now the question is, for which classes of graphs does there exist a function f so that the average degree of each graph in the class is at most some function of its biclic number. And I want a name to talk about these classes. These classes have been studied in the literature before, uh, especially 
by uh, this paper of Bonamy, Bousquet, Pilipchuk, Brzezewski, Tomase, and Valchuk, uh, and also by a paper of Scott Seymour and Spherical. So these have been studied before, but I don't know if there's a standardized name for them. And so I'm going to call these classes degree bounded. This should really be average degree bounded or something, but it's easier for me to just say degree bounded. So let's do that. Uh, and I'll call F a uh, bounding function. Okay. And so the conjecture from before, this analog of Tomasin's conjecture before induced subgraphs can be equivalently worded as the following. Uh, a class is degree bounded if and only if it does not contain graphs of arbitrarily large average degree in girth. Right, so this is an equivalent statement of the conjecture. Right, and it's clear that if a class is degree bounded, then it doesn't contain graphs of arbitrarily large average degree in girth. So the real content is uh, of the conjecture would be the other direction. And likewise, the theorems from before, uh, combining those two theorems that we talked about, gives you the following theorem. A class is degree bounded if and only if there exists a constant C such that every bipartite four cycle free graph in the class has average degree at most C. So I think, I think this is really surprising. It says I have this class that the average degree is at most some function of the biquig number. And the theorem tells you, you don't actually care about that function at all. There's just one constant that you really care about. And that's the constant counting the average degree of the bipartite four cycle free graphs in the class. And so in some at least intuitive sense, we should have that this function is totally controlled by this constant C. And so like the question from earlier was asking, in fact, the proof of this theorem, if you go through both, both proofs, uh, you get that every degree bounded class has a bounding function of this order, uh, this quadruply uh, exponential, uh, and then with the polynomial in tau. Uh, so I think it's surprising really that there's any bounds at all. And this parallels some questions on the chromatic number that I want to talk about in a second. But first of all, let me talk about the lower bounds. Uh, I don't even know of a degree bounded class, which provably doesn't have a degree bounding function that's a polynomial. So uh, I'd like to know the answer to this question. Does every degree bounded class have a bounding function that is a polynomial? And for people familiar with chi boundedness, this is like Esperi's conjecture, but for average degree instead of chromatic number. By the way, you can show that there's no way to bound the degree of this polynomial by looking at off-diagonal Ramsey numbers. This is the same way you can do it for chromatic number and it works for average degree as well. Uh, and so I'd really like some people in the audience to work on this, on this question. I've thought about it for a couple of days, but I think there's still like a lot more going on here. It's something that I've wanted to have time to get back to for a while. And it's something that I think the audience of this seminar would be particularly well prepared to do in particular because it's the probability and combinatoric seminar. And I think that you sh there's real hope for being able to show a super polynomial lower bounds using probabilistic techniques. And if you want to do that, you should apply this theorem, right? So you want to create a class that has a super polynomial lower bounds. And the only upper bound you need to show is this one, that every bipartite four cycle free graph in the class is average degree at most C. OK, so I think that there's real hope to, to answering this question and showing a super polynomial lower bound. But we know that you can't have these functions grow arbitrarily large. OK, so now let me talk about this analogous setting for the chromatic number. So here the leading question is for which classes of graphs does there exist a function f? So that the chromatic number of each graph in the class is the most that function of its peak number. And so again, the point is that uh, the peak number is an obvious lower bound on the chromatic number. And so the question is, when is some function of that also an upper bound? Uh, and 
sense, let me just get some terminology. So it's really analogous to the terminology from before. So we'll call such a class chi bounded and F is that chi bounding function. And a lot of these problems go back to Garfish and Summer from the 70s. Uh, and so these questions have been around for a while and even really basic theorems and graph theory like Vizing's theorem uh, can be worded this way. But it was only solved really, really recently, earlier this year, this analogous question about, so for average degree, we said it's enough to look at the four cycle free graphs for a chromatic number. The natural question is, is it enough to only look at the triangle free graphs in the class? And Carbonero, Homp, Moore, and Spirkel uh, prove that the answer is no, that there exist graphs with arbitrarily large chromatic number, but no triangle free induced subgraph of chromatic number, at least K. So this is really different than, than the case of average degree. And this was only solved in like March of this year. And now there's this other question about, is there always a chi bounding function that's a polynomial? This was a question of Esprit has been open for a bit over a, a decade. And there's no direct relationship to this theorem here, but I think it was rather widely believed that if you could prove a theorem like this, that you could then eventually uh, disprove Esprit's conjecture. And indeed, it took about two days <laughs> for Brionsky, Davies, and Falchek to do that. So just within a couple of days from uh, this theorem being posted on archive, uh, they showed that there is a chi-bounded class that does not have a chi-bounding function, which is a polynomial. Uh, so they were able to adjust the construction from this theorem to prove this theorem. And in fact, they showed something stronger than this. They showed that every fast enough growing function is an optimal chi-bounding function of a chi-bounded class. So it's really, really, really bad. Uh, it's, I think, impossible. Like, it's hard for that to settle in just how bad it is. I mean, as long as you're growing quickly enough, uh, Rather, and you're you're actually large enough. Is then for each omega you're big enough, then uh, you are this optimal chi bounding function of a chi bounded class. Uh, okay, so we've seen that the case of chi boundedness and degree boundedness are really really analogous. You can ask the same questions in both of these two different contexts. Uh, one is natural for the chromatic number, and one is natural for the average degree. Uh, but that the actual theorems that you get are quite different. They don't work the same way. And now I want to kind of take a step back for a second and look at concrete examples of these classes to say why these are really different. So it's easy to see that not every chi bounded class is degree bounded because you can just take bipartite graphs. They have bounded chromatic number, but not bounded average degree. So that's. Uh, not very interesting. Uh, and then the other direction has something a little bit more going on. And so you can show that not every degree bounded class is chi bounded. You might look at this and think, this is a funny way of drawing a five cycle. Why do the edges go past the ends of the vertices? Uh, but what I'm actually drawing here is a set of line segments in the plane. And then I'm going to make a graph from it by adding a vertex for each line segment and putting an edge between two vertices if the line segments intersect. And so these actual graphs are called segment intersection graphs. I'll just put the name there. Uh, so this is the actual graph that we're interested in. And Pavlik Kotsik Kravchik, Leson, Michek, Trotter, and Volchek showed that this class of graphs is not chi bounded. This was also open for a while, but they showed that um, certain graphs called Berlin graphs can are segment intersection graphs. And this is a picture from their paper about how they, they did that. That's also a really pretty way of, of seeing this. Uh, but these classes are not chi bounded. Uh, but they are degree bounded. And one way of seeing that is that all of their induced subgraphs with growth at least five have bounded average degree. And uh, the way that I worded it here uses this theorem that's enough to reduce to the graphs of high growth. But in fact, Fox and Pock gave a more direct proof that they're degree bounded. 
earlier. In fact, uh, they have really small separators once you forbid a KTT subgraph. Okay, so this is uh, uh, the most natural example I know of of a class that is degree bounded, but not chi bounded. So let's look at some more examples of degree bounded classes. There's a lot of really important examples of chi bounded classes, but a lot less is known about degree bounded classes. And so I wanna go through what the actual examples are. Uh, so Scott Seymour and Spherical showed that if you forbid a tree, then you uh, are degree bounded and that you have a polynomial degree bounding function. So for any forest F, the class of graphs with no induced F has average degree at most and polynomial and their bifid number. And this is really nice because it's an analog of the Garfish Sumner conjecture, but for degree boundedness instead of chi boundedness. So the Garfish Sumner conjecture says that in fact you can take the chromatic number to be at most some function of, of the clique number and that's still open. Okay, and there are also other examples that are, are known. So uh, this group showed that if you forbid long cycles, then you're also degree bounded with the polynomial bounding function. And indeed, a shorter, really pretty proof was given by Scott, Seymour, and Spherical as well. So I got the order of these papers out of order. Uh, and Kuhn and Ostis showed an even more general theorem. They showed that for any graph H, if you forbid all induced subdivisions of H, then that class is degree bounded. So to take a subdivision, what you're doing is you're allowed to replace edges of the graph by vertices of degree two like this. And so in these pictures, I've drawn some induced subdivisions of uh, K4. And so the theorem of Kuhn and says that for any graph H, if you forbid all of its subdivisions, that then you're degree bounded. And I wanted to point out that this implies the above theorem, but if you don't care about this function, if you just want to let it be any function rather than a polynomial. And this also implies the segment intersection graphs are uh, degree bounded. So this earlier example we saw is also from a class that forbids uh, all into subdivisions of something. And so I think the, the takeaway from this for me is actually that we don't know that many interesting classes that are degree bounded. Really, most of them come from, from this theorem and this theorem, as well as uh, looking at uh, these examples from extremal, extremal graph theory where you uh, have bounded stable set size. Okay, so let's uh, kind of go back over this and look at the comparison between these two cases. So uh, class is degree bounded if this, the average degree is squished between, uh, you know, is upper and lower bounded by some function of the bifid number. And for chi boundedness, you have this analog, but where average degree is like chromatic number, and instead of bicliques, you care about cliques. And for the degree bounded case, you know that uh, there's always a degree bounded function of this order, but for chi bounding functions, you can't improve this at all. There's no way to bound the growth rates of this function. Okay, so let me go back through. I wanna talk about some of the proofs and where this bound actually comes from. And if you want to improve the bounds, then this is, is really, the, I think, the, the part to, to pay attention to. So let's begin with the theorem of Quan, Lester, Sudikov, and Tron, which says that every graph of sufficiently large average degree has either KT or an induced bipartite subgraph of average degree at least D. So you already lose a bit here, but what I want to talk about is the way that they, they prove this theorem. So if you're triangle free, as in this case, uh, what's the best bound you can get from this function for the maximum average degree of an induced bipartite graph? And for that, we have a lower bound that's exponential. 
So the point is that this function here has to be exponential in D. And so if you want to improve this bound to be a polynomial, you can't reduce to bipartite graphs. That's, that's the key here. And this is really a big problem. Uh, Right, so the point is that if you want to find a polynomial bound, you can't reduce to the case of bipartite graphs. Uh, and this is another reason why I'd really like someone to show a super polynomial lower bounds for the degree boundedness question. I think that the right answer here should be something more like singly exponential. That would be, would be my guess. Uh, okay, and for the Kuninospis results, uh, their results is something like doubly exponential whenever you don't care about induced subgraphs, but you're just looking for a subgraph. And Montgomery, Pogrovsky, and Sudikov were able to improve their result to get a singly exponential bound. So that every bipartite graph of average degree, uh, at least two to some polynomial in D has a subgraph with average degree at least D and no four cycles. Uh, and they also showed a lower bound, but the lower bounds is, I think, kind of unfortunate. It's only of the order d to the three minus little o of one. So there has already been some work even for the non-induced problem of trying to show lower bounds. And even that is already quite hard. That was the, the point that I wanted to, to make here. So if you want to, again, prove a polynomial bound, you have a lot of work to do. And even if you could improve the non-induced subgraph case, that would already be, be big progress. Okay, and if you want to get an induced subgraph, this is what the, the bound looks like whenever you're working in bipartite graphs. Okay, so let me say a little bit about where this comes from and what the proof of this theorem is. So remember the theorem is that every bipartite graph of large average degree has either KTT or an induced subgraph with average degree at least C and no four cycles. So how does the proof go? Well, as I mentioned, it's based on this proof of the Monica, Kubik, Martin, and Rodel in the non-induced case. Uh, and the one of the key parts is that you can reduce to graphs which are regular on one side. So the point is that if you have large enough average degree, then you can, and you're working in a bipartite graph, then you can find a bipartite graph where every vertex in this side has degree R. And this side is much smaller than the other one. So I'll write that as saying that A is a lot bigger than B. Right, and so if you have that one side is a lot smaller than the other one, and the big side is regular with high degree, then that tells you that the average degree is large and we stay working with graphs like this throughout the whole proof. Uh, what's really nice about this is that now you're really working with hypergraphs. So you can imagine that for each vertex in A, if it has R incident edges, then you can look at that neighborhood in B. And so you get an R uniform hypergraph on B uh, and that lets you use some of the tools uh, from hypergraph theory. And in particular, it lets you apply a theorem of Fioretti. And that theorem says that in this setting where you have uh, lambda B many hyper edges, you can, after deleting some things in A, but not too many, you can partition B into R parts so that every vertex in A has exactly one neighbor in each of the R parts. And moreover, if you have two parts which contribute a four cycle, then every pair of vertices with a common neighbor actually have many common neighbors. Okay, let me go through that again. I think this is pretty technical. So the point is every vertex on the left-hand side in A has degree R and A is a constant factor bigger than B. As long as that constant factor is big enough, then you can keep A being a constant factor bigger than B while also achieving the following property. So I'm partitioning B into R parts so that each vertex in A has exactly one neighbor in each of those R parts. 
And moreover, if you give me a pair of parts which contribute a four cycle, then every pair of vertices from those parts which have a common neighbor actually have at least T common neighbors. Uh, okay, so you can think of this as like a Ramsey type theorem for uh, uniform hypergraphs with a constant number of, of edges. And so the key idea of, of the proof is that once we've applied Pioretti's theorem to get this sort of a uniform, uh, all the four cycles look this uniform way, uh, then we are either going to get a lot of parts in B that look like this, that contribute a lot of four cycles, or we'll get a lot of parts in B that contribute no four cycles. And if we get a lot that contribute four cycles, we'll end up with this picture. We'll have a vertex, and then on the right, we'll have some neighbors of that vertex, and this whole thing will still have large average degree, and we'll be able to imply induction on uh, T. We remember that's the size of the complete bipartite graph that we're looking for. Right, and in the case where we get a lot of parts that contribute no four cycles, we'll immediately win, and we'll immediately get our induced subgraph with no four cycles. Okay, so that's just the, the general idea for how this goes. So the question that I want to, to leave off with is really this one. Does every degree of bounded class have a bounding function that is a polynomial? And so there's two things that I'd really like people to look at for that. And that is uh, showing a super polynomial lower bounds, which I think should be the case. Uh, and the second question is, even if you forbid all induced subdivisions of K4, for instance, it's not known if you can get a polynomial upper bounds. All right, thank you. Great, thank you very much. Um, so, uh, so I know, I know Zach had a question. Um, Zach, would you like to ask a question? Yeah. Um, so, in the non-induced case, it's known that uh, if you have n times log log n edges, that we get these um, arbitrarily high girth, arbitrarily high average degree subgraphs. And so okay. I was wondering if for fixed T and fixed C greater than zero, can we show that uh, oh, graph? Wait, sorry. With fixed T and fixed C greater than zero, can you show that? Yeah, that a graph with average degree uh, n to the C, um, it does there exist an induced subgraph is, yeah, that has, you know, arbitrarily high growth, arbitrary. Oh, and, and of course, lacks uh, bipartite uh, by right, right, right. the graphs of KTT. Right. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, so you mentioned that before that uh, the theorem is that if you have n log log n edges, that then you get uh, a four cycle free subgraph of large average degree. Yeah. Or, for or even large girth. Or uh, yeah, that's that's a recent corollary of a uh, work by Sudikov and Janzer. Um, gotcha. So I I guess one of my questions about this is uh, if these subgraphs are spanning. Uh, I I didn't know about this theorem, and so I'm interested in it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So basically, what uh, uh, Janzer and Sudikov showed, uh, they're going to talk about it uh, a few months ago, was that essentially once you have this many edges, then we can pass to, or that times some sufficiently large constant, we can pass to mm -hmm. fairly large regular subgraphs. So, uh, right, right. And yeah. Right, so, so for me, this regime of having log log n edges is a lot different than just saying that it's uh, some large constant, but actually having yeah. it depend on the number of vertices. So I really don't have intuition for this question that you've asked. Yeah, but, so uh, about I guess you, you induced know. subgraphs, but I think it's a natural question to ask. Okay, cool. Yeah, thanks. Uh, and I think that one of the things which is different in the two regimes is that there has been some work on asking when can you get a spanning subgraph of large growth and large average degree. Uh, so it's known that uh, if you're an expander, then you can do this. And I don't know what the analogous questions would be for the induced setting because, of course, the spanning question doesn't make sense. All right, I see. Cool. 
So I, I had a question, which is, um, do, do you believe there should be a polynomial version of the Kunos two theorem? They, that's a really good question as well. I've thought about uh, this a little bit, but you're kind of dead in the water for trying to adjust their proof because they immediately pass to bipartite graphs. And for that, there's this exponential lower bound. So I don't know. Uh, for me, I think the main questions are trying to get a singly exponential upper bound and then a super polynomial lower bound. I mean, I would think that the right answer should be somewhere around around that. Uh, I do think that you could hope to prove for K2T a polynomial bound. If I was going to try and get a polynomial bound for the Kunosis theorem, I would try and push it through for K2T first because even that is open and that seems that there are techniques that could work for that. That seems, that seems much more tractable. Right, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I guess if I'm gonna be bold and answer the question then I'm just gonna say no, but. <laughs> What, what about your um, your own theorem with the tower? Do, do, mm -hmm. do you think that I mean, a smaller uh, tower, but not, right. not polynomial? <laughs> right, yeah. I think that getting this smaller tower of like this form should be doable. And this is a project that I think is really approachable. Uh, there are some nice ideas in this paper uh, that improves the Kuhnanosis results to a single exponential. And they definitely don't directly work for induced subgraphs, but using that sort of thing, I think they could hope to improve the tower. Okay, any other questions? Hi, uh, you, you said you think there's ought to be a probabilistic uh, argument giving this um, super polynomial amount, but mm -hmm. very roughly, how should that work, or where does the probability bit come in? Right. Uh, I guess for me, some of the intuition is that uh, you can at least show things about off the diagonal Ramsey numbers using this probabilistic approach. Uh -huh. uh, and so for me, that's kind of the intuition for why that's a good approach for doing this. Uh, it's also how. Let me see if I can go back quickly. I've got a lot of slides since there's some pictures that just change a little bit. Okay, maybe I'll scroll through everything. Uh, right. So back at the very beginning, I mentioned that you can't reduce to regular graphs for this problem. This is also a probabilistic proof where you, uh, you're going to take the union of a lot of star cores that look like this, right? So the vertex sets on the left is going to be the same every time, but the vertices on the right are going to be disjoint. And you start off by taking some vertices of really, really, really high degree, and then some vertices of huge degree, but a little bit less so, and so on, mm -hmm. right? And each star force is random. Uh, and that's how you can show this example as well. It's also true that just a normal random construction like G and P gives you uh, this exponential lower bounds for reducing to bipartite graphs in the induced setting. So I don't know if I have a really particular idea of what construction should work. But there are these three examples of lower bounds that are all coming from different probabilistic constructions. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, <clears throat> if no other questions, um, uh, let's all unmute and 